Josh White. I lead the producer education team here at NCBA. Welcome, everyone. We're excited to have a great big crowd on to hear the latest from our DC team on uh, what we can expect from uh, this new administration. Uh, just a few quick reminders for those of you that haven't joined one of our webinars before. Uh, you're muted, your line is, because we have several hundred folks on and uh, the feedback would not allow us to present well, but uh, you can type in any questions that you have throughout the night uh, into the chat box and I'll moderate those questions out as many as we can get to uh, toward the end of the, uh, of the uh, session here. And also, if you have friends or, or neighbors that are interested, we are recording this, and so we will post it up in the next few days at the NCBA site on the webinar landing page. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off uh, to Ethan Lane and uh, Tanner Bamer. Well, thank you, Josh, and good evening from Washington, everybody. Uh, this is Ethan Lane. I am the Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. I oversee our operations in Washington, D.C. Uh, joining me tonight is Tanner Beamer. He is our Director of Government Affairs uh, for Market and Regulatory Policy. Uh, we're going to go through a little bit of a discussion tonight about all of the changes that we are experiencing in Washington right now. Obviously, following the election in November, we have a brand new 117th Congress to contend with, as well as the incoming Biden administration, which will be inaugurated next week. And we want to give you a little bit of a sense of what that means for us in the cattle industry, what we can expect moving into the next few years, and how we're planning to engage with this new team in Washington. First of all, obviously, anybody who has been following the news in the last few months knows that it has been uh, quite, a, uh, quite a period of time to be in Washington, D.C. Uh, following the election in, in November, we have seen a lot of activity, obviously, in the news surrounding the vote surrounding the vote count in different parts of the country, a lot of challenges to that vote on behalf of President Trump and his legal team. Uh, we've been tracking those, obviously, here in the Washington, D.C. office, and I know you all have as well, uh, culminating in the unfortunate events in the nation's capital last week. Normally, we would be coming to you from our office in uh, Washington, D.C. on Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, but we are coming to you instead from the other side of the river in Virginia, because the city has been effectively locked down in anticipation of next week's inauguration. Uh, everything from the White House to the Capitol and all of the buildings in between at this point are in uh, sort of a security bubble that we expect to stay in place at least through next Thursday. Uh, so, so we are coming to you from a, uh, a little bit of a backup location tonight. Um, and, you know, that has been sort of the story of 2020 and now going into 2021 here in Washington. Uh, we've really had to adapt to new ways of engaging with Capitol Hill and with the administration, first due to coronavirus, and then due to all of the civil unrest we have experienced in our nation's capital over the course of the year. Uh, we are one of the only trade associations, and I believe the only one in agriculture that stayed open throughout the coronavirus pandemic. My team continues to come to the office every day. Um, through the course of the pandemic, we've only had to stay home, I believe, twice or two days each time uh, because of a uh, uh, risk of somebody having come in contact with COVID-19. But we've had to shut down the D.C. office for safety reasons now five times over the course of the year. Uh, if that gives you any idea of what kind of year we've had in Washington. But as we sit here today, uh, we have put uh, all of those issues to bed as far as the federal system is concerned. And we do anticipate a transition to occur uh, on schedule next Wednesday uh, with the inauguration of the new president. We'll start with the White House and, and uh, what we're going to be expecting there. Obviously, uh, first on the list is a, a little bit of discussion about what the Biden-Harris team plans to do uh, with their first 100 days in office. That's always a metric that we look to with the new president. Uh, it's something that's asked about uh, very quickly uh, towards the end of an election cycle. It's the first question a newly elected president has to answer is what they plan to do in their first 100 days in office. And here's what we know about what the Biden-Harris team is planning on working on in their first 100 days. First and foremost, obviously, we expect to hear and see a lot about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, obviously, we've been hearing a lot about the COVID-19 pandemic for most of the last year, but the Biden team is, is promising a renewed uh, engagement on that front. Obviously, we now have uh, multiple vaccines that have moved out into the country. 
Uh, the states are going through their different tier systems to administer that vaccine as quickly as possible. And we're hearing from Vice President, now President-elect Biden, and his team uh, that they expect to spend a lot of time on the continued pandemic response, as well as additional stimulus uh, in addition to what we just saw in that $900 billion COVID relief bill that was passed just before Christmas from Congress. As of late this afternoon, we've heard that number for the Vice President, now President-elect, excuse me, uh, is, is going to be something like $1.9 billion uh, that, he's, that he's suggesting for a follow-up round of COVID, or excuse me, uh, $1.9 trillion uh, that, he's, that he's proposing for another round of COVID relief. We'll start hearing more details about that, we imagine, in the coming days, uh, but I would imagine it will include another $2,000 payment, as has been discussed. Now, obviously, that will still need to move, move through the United States Congress, and we'll get into some of the challenges there a little later in the webinar. Another issue, I mean, technical difficulties. There we go. Another issue that we know they're going to be spending a lot of time on is job creation, uh, as well as the public health job force and manufacturing and research. Uh, these are priorities that uh, President-elect Biden uh, talked about on the campaign trail. You know, we've been tracking those job reports uh, month over month during the pandemic. Um, we saw a, a less positive job report here. Uh, uh, just the most recent version, uh, and, and that will be one of the, the marquee issues that, uh, that Biden and Harris focus on right out of the gate. Healthcare, obviously, this is not a new issue for Democrats. Uh, this, is, this is something that we uh, fully expected that they would want to return to, uh, especially given uh, President-elect Biden's connection to the previous Democratic administration during the Obama years. Um, so we expect that there will be a renewed, uh, robust discussion on that front starting very quickly uh, after inauguration. And then another area we're intently focused on um, is some of the gains that we've made over the last four years on the tax front are going to come back up for discussion again. Uh, we fully expect that the Biden team will want to reapproach some of those. Uh, that's an area where we're going to really have to engage strongly to make sure that they understand the negative consequences to cattle producers and landowners around the country uh, to some of the tax changes they may be contemplating. Uh, obviously, one of the chief tax changes that's going to be back up on the table for discussion again is the death tax, uh, the estate tax. So we're going to be re-engaging in that conversation, but there's a lot more in that in that suite of issues that we expect they will want to start talking about um, and looking for ways to uh, rebalance those taxes that's more in line with the Democratic platform. And, and through all of this, one thing that you really are going to hear a lot about, and I know we've already been talking about a lot of this during the campaign, is, is those undertones of climate change. Uh, we're going to be hearing about that, not just in the areas that you would expect to hear it, um, the, the, the areas that you always hear, it, whether that's oil and gas production or transportation, or obviously uh, unfairly most of the time uh, as it relates to the cattle industry as well. Uh, but we are going to be seeing that crop up. We're going to be seeing references to it throughout the federal system. Uh, this is something that the Biden team has made very clear in a lot of the, uh, uh, the white papers and, and documentation that the transition team has already put together. Uh, you can see that everywhere in their in their thought process. That's something they plan to be very aggressive on and engage in uh, across the federal system. So how is he going to get this done? What are we going to be seeing as far as cabinet picks? Well, at the beginning of the Trump administration, if you'll recall, uh, we went through a fairly long process of of naming uh, cabinet picks. It was it was kind of one by one and, and, and lasted for quite some time. President-elect Biden and his team have taken a different approach, uh, you might say a more traditional approach, in that they have uh, very quickly moved to name their nominees in, a, in more of a batch. They have named all of the uh, key nominees for, for his cabinet. Um, the intent there being to try to get them confirmed in the U.S. Senate as quickly as possible after uh, nomination next week. There's a real sense in this transition and in this, the cabinet members that have been named of, of callback to the previous Obama administration. There are a lot of Obama alumni in the mix in this transition, both in the transition teams and in those cabinet picks that are coming back in some new roles, also some reprising roles they've held previously. The, the, the most notable, obviously, being former Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack, who has been named uh, to, to rejoin that role with the Department of Agriculture in the new administration. One thing we can tell from these picks is that President-elect Biden and his team are really looking to those people who understand the federal system, who understand the regulatory process, and don't have a ramp-up period or a learning curve when they get to Washington. That's something that, that really is going to be a, a, an interesting change 
um, from a lot of uh, you know business community folks and others that certainly understand how the economy works and how the business community works, but maybe weren't as versed in, in, in the regulatory structure uh, that we've seen over the last few years in the Trump administration. This is going to be really heavy on DC experts, folks that know these agencies, they know where the light switches are, and they will be able to hit the ground running on day one of this administration. There is a wide range of ideologies and view on display in this team as well. Uh, this is indicative of the larger uh, battle that we're seeing play out in the Democratic Party but between some of those moderates uh, that we heard very vocally complaining right after the election about things like the Green New Deal, things like defund the police, and how difficult those, those things made it for them to get reelected um, in more moderate districts. You're going to see that, that wing of the party really clash with that further left wing of the Democratic Party uh, that's really pushing hard on some of that social change, um, some of that generational change um, that really kind of forms the foundation of a lot of their get out the vote efforts uh, across the country, specifically in some of the more densely populated urban areas uh, throughout the country. That's going to really be on full display as far as debating amongst those cabinet members uh, for, for positions uh, in this administration. Uh, you know, that's not always a bad thing. That creates some opportunity for groups like us to make our opinions heard and to find some allies in this administration uh, who are looking for ways to make sure that rural America, agriculture, and other interests like that are not left by the wayside um, by some of the pressure from, from the further left wing of the party. We expect this transition process to move very quickly. Uh, we expect that uh, because of that knowledge of the system, because of those deep relationships on Capitol Hill, uh, the, the, the nominees that are uh, that are not contentious, and, and you know, Tom Vilsack is probably a great example of that, just aren't going to receive uh, the kind of drawn out battles that we saw uh, at the beginning of this administration, or even that we saw in the Obama administration with some of those nominees. Um, we expect that some of these will move very quickly. We've heard indications from some Republicans on, uh, in the Senate uh, that, that they are going to be looking for opportunities to give Biden his cabinet members where they're agreeable. So that, that is something we can expect is for uh, President-elect Biden to have a fully staffed cabinet very quickly in the process. Now, this cabinet is divided into some unique and very telling categories as well. First, let's talk about some of the domestic nominees and appointees. We already talked about Tom Bilsack, former governor of Iowa and former secretary of agriculture. Pete Buttigieg, uh, mayor of South Bend, Indiana. He was a Democratic presidential candidate in 2020. I'm sure all of you have seen a lot of media coverage. He was kind of a media darling uh, early in the early in the process. Uh, this is going to be a real platform for Pete Buttigieg within the Democratic Party uh, to showcase his skill set. And you're going to see a lot of this throughout some of these nominees. If they weren't former Obama administration appointees, then they're almost certainly otherwise uh, future candidates for high office in the Democratic Party. Uh, this is this is going to be a really important farm system for this administration to start bringing some of those people to light. Uh, as they move into the, the first months of their administration. And then Catherine Tai has been nominated as U.S. Trade Representative, former Chief Counsel for the House Ways and Means Committee. She's the former Chief Counsel for the China Trade Enforcement at USTR. Uh, she's somebody we've worked with in the past, we have a relationship with, we expect to be able to work well with her uh, on trade issues in the new in the new administration. And I'll remind you, you know, we had a good we got a good relationship, a good working relationship with the Obama administration on trade issues as well. So that's one of those areas where we feel like there's going to be a lot of room to run. They're certainly going to look at some of these issues differently than the, than the Trump administration did. There's certainly going to be some push and pull on things like tariffs uh, that have been a really important tool in the Trump administration. Uh, but by and large, that's going to be an area where we're really going to be able to engage aggressively in this administration. On the economic side, uh, we have Janet Yellen returning. Uh, she was the former chair of the Federal Reserve and also the former chair of the White House Council on Economic Advisors. If confirmed, she will be the first person to hold all three of those roles in the federal government. Um, so that's, that's another one of those that obviously harkens back to the Obama team and shows a lot of consistency uh, with, with, that, with that administration. Gina Raimundo has been nominated as Secretary of Commerce, former governor of Rhode Island uh, and a venture capitalist. You see a lot of that financial uh, element in the Biden team as well. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, obviously anyone who follows politics knows uh, that, that President-elect Biden received a lot of support from Wall Street, received a lot of support from that end of the world, and that's reflected by some of these nominees like Gina Raimundo. Uh, Marty Walsh has been nominated as Secretary of Labor, former mayor of Boston, and uh, former Labor's Union Local 223 president at the uh, ripe old age of 21. Uh, again, 
there's another tie in there to labor union support for, for President elect Biden for the Democratic Party generally. Moving into the climate nominees, and this is an area that's really going to be interesting because they've really gone to great lengths to throw a wide net over what they're calling the climate, the climate suite of advisors. Uh, first on that list is the nominee for Secretary of the Interior, uh, Deb Holland. Uh, she is uh, currently a congresswoman from the 1st District of New Mexico, or previously was, uh, and vice chair of the House Committee on Natural Resources. Uh, Deb is someone who has been very vocal on issues like uh, I, uh, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline, Standing Rock. Um, she's somebody who has been very vocal on tribal issues uh, during her time on Capitol Hill. And she's also been very vocal uh, in opposition to our position on uh, the president's use of uh, monument authority, creating national monuments uh, uh, using the Antiquities Act. So there are going to be some issues there that we're going to have to work really hard to help her understand our perspective on and, and try to find some ways to, uh, to find some common ground uh, with uh, incoming Secretary Holland, should she be confirmed. At EPA, we're expected to see Michael Regan uh, as administrator for EPA. He is currently the secretary for the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality and former associate vice president uh, at, the, at the Environmental Defense Fund. Now, this is someone that uh, has received a lot of discussion since his nomination. And what we've heard from folks in North Carolina uh, and others that have worked with him, and he actually spent some time, if I recall, at the at, at EPA previously as well, um, is, is that he's a guy who, who we can work with. He's a guy that is open to talking to agriculture. Uh, he, he wants to be collaborative. He, he, he's been uh, open to dealing with the cattle industry in the past. Um, you know, it, it's not uh, that's not to say that he's not going to have views that are probably uh, left of center relative to where most cattle producers probably look at some of those issues. Uh, but he has been open to the conversation. We've already had uh, some successful conversations with him uh, during the transition, and and uh, we're we're anticipating having a good working dialogue uh, with incoming Administrator Regan uh, as he hits the office. That's going to be really key as we talk about the future of things like the Navigable Waters Protection Rule um, and some of these clean air and water guidelines that have been so pivotal for us uh, in in past years. And then Brenda Mallory uh, as chair of the Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, she was formerly the Director of Regulatory Policy at the Southern Environmental Law Center, and she has formerly been at DEQ as a chief counsel. There's another Obama administration tie in there. DEQ, for those of you that don't deal with it, is really an important office at the White House. That is where they formulate NEPA policy. So anybody who's operating with a federal grazing lease, anybody who has a federal nexus and needs to deal with that NEPA element, um, really needs to be paying attention to CEQ. That's where we engaged aggressively during the Trump administration for the massive NEPA rewrite of those regulations that was achieved over the last few years. So we'll be looking closely at how she's going to be handling some of that. We'll be looking to engage early and have some of those discussions uh, to help her understand the importance of some of the critical changes that have been made to NEPA over the last few years. Other notable nominees and appointees, obviously John Kerry. Uh, former Secretary of State under President Obama and former U.S. Senator from Massachusetts. He will be the special presidential envoy for climate. Um, they're not using climate czar. They're using uh, that for Gina McCarthy. Uh, but he is certainly going to be serving in that type of role uh, for, for President-elect Biden. Uh, Merrick Garland, former nominee for the Supreme Court at the end of the Obama administration, obviously much covered in the media. Uh, for his failure to to be confirmed uh, as as a Supreme Court justice is going to be returning as uh, the Attorney General nominee. Uh, he has been a federal appellate judge, um, and obviously, if you'll recall, some of the discussion when he was nominated uh, is that he was a fairly palatable co uh, choice uh, to the Republican side of the aisle. Um, among some of those picks that that may interpret uh, federal statute in a way that that would be really uh, negative to a lot of our interests in the cattle industry. Uh, Merrick Garland uh, appeared to be somebody uh, that, 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 that the Democratic Party could pick that um, wouldn't be too bad to work with. So we would expect that in his role as Attorney General, uh, he'll bring some of that more moderate tone as well. Um, and and uh, we'll be uh, looking to engage with him as well where appropriate. Now turning to Capitol Hill, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague Tanner Beamer here to start going through some of that list. Thanks, Ethan. So obviously there's been quite a bit of turnover and we had a, an election at one point that was uh, uh, pretty uh, hard fought, and there were a lot of transitions and changes from retirement to incumbent members that lost seats. Um, and so we'll kind of walk through the, the lay of the land up on Capitol Hill uh, as it currently stands in the 117th Congress, which is already well underway. 
starting with the United States Senate. There was a lot of talk about the state of Georgia uh, and the runoff elections down there. Um, unfortunately for the Republican Party, uh, both of those seats were locked. They were flipped for the first time in over 30 years in both of those cases. Um, on the top picture there, that's the Reverend Raphael Warnock. He uh, actually is a pastor at Martin Luther King's former church. And then uh, beneath him is John Ossoff, who's kind of a, a a uh, chronic candidate down in Georgia. He ran against Karen Handel uh, in a special election for the 6th District back in 2018, um, and then also uh, ran a, another race there in Georgia. Both of those have uh, succeeded their Republican counterparts, which tips the balance of power in the Senate to 50-50, which is total, utter gridlock from a partisan politics perspective. For those of you that are wondering what those two yellow dots are on the Democrat side of the aisle, that would be Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont and Senator Angus King from Maine. Both of those are technically registered as independents, but they caucus with the Democrats and vote with them 99% of the time. Uh, don't quote me on that 99% figure, but it is fairly frequently. Uh, in the situation where the Senate is divided, the vice president obviously gets to serve as the tiebreaker. According to Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution, uh, they serve as the president of the Senate. Obviously, that is going to be a veteran of the Senate in Senator Kamala Harris, who will be uh, the vice president-elect and vice president as of next week. Um, so you can look to uh, the Democrats to have uh, technically have control of the body, even though in terms of membership, they are evenly split. And so in that situation, Mitch McConnell, who has enjoyed the office of majority leader for the last couple Congresses um, and, he, and minority leader during the Obama years, for the most part, um, and Chuck Schumer on the Democratic side of the aisle, uh, their roles will now reverse. Mitch McConnell will effectively become the minority leader, while Chuck Schumer is the effective majority leader in the United States Senate. Since uh, the vice president is in the Democratic Party, uh, that now means that well, actually, I should back up for a second. So it's actually very interesting that um, the vice president gets to come into play. Uh, Kamala Harris will only get to cast a vote if there is a 50-50 tie. She does not get to make a tie. She does not get to cast a vote unless the Senate is split 50-50, which means that the two new most powerful senators in the body are Joe Manchin from West Virginia, who is a very moderate Democrat and supported a lot of President Trump's priorities, and then on the Republican side, you have Senator Susan Collins from Maine, who just uh, handily won her re-election bid during this last election cycle. She is well known for bucking the president on several of his uh, appointees and nominees, uh, and she was uh, somewhat of a, an undecided vote for much of the last impeachment trial. So these two moderate members of their party are going to be very, very influential, because if the Republicans can pick up Manchin on a vote, that means that they have won. If the Democrats can pick up Susan Collins, that means that they have won. Uh, Susan Collins is not the only person on the Republican side of the aisle that we would classify as, as somewhat of a flip. Um, Mitt Romney, obviously, is one that uh, has balked with the president a couple different times over the course of his two years in the Senate. And then others as well would, would probably fit that bill on the Republican side of the ledger. So look to them to make some very key decisions um, during these debates upcoming. And then obviously with uh, Democrats taking effective control of the Senate, we can expect to see some new committee chairs. Um, many of these are going to be the ones that are serving as the top Democrats on each committee. Senator Tom Carper, who's been ranking on environment and public work, uh, we expect him to take the gavel there. That uh, moderate Senator Manchin, we expect him to take the gavel at the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, for all of the issues we engage with, that committee, that is a pretty good sign. We have established a very good working relationship with Senator Manchin and his team in the uh, ENR committee. Senator Wyden from Oregon chairs the Senate Finance Committee. That is a very powerful, very coveted position in the Senate. Anytime that there are trade deals that are brought up, the Finance Committee is the one to consider that, um, as well as a lot of the tax bills that uh, we can expect to see in the Biden administration. And then, of course, Senator Patrick Leahy, who will also become the president pro tem, of the Senate is also set to chair the Appropriations Committee. And then, of course, the big ticket item for our purposes is going to be Senator Debbie Stabenow. Now, she is a known quantity to us and to Capitol Hill. She has a very high seniority rank in the Senate, which we'll talk about in a minute. But as of right now, we do expect her to be the chair of the Agriculture Committee. Uh, she was during the negotiations of the 2014 Farm Bill. She's very challenging on cattle issues. Coming from the state of Michigan, she has a very uh, high specialty crop emphasis, and you saw that a little bit during the negotiations in the CARES Act 
um, when livestock were called out uh, for uh, additional funding through the CARES Act, as were specialty crops, she played a very big role in getting that over the finish line. Now, I should say that these are, are just expectations, and there is one shakeup in the, uh, in the process that could lead to some downstream effect for the entire makeup of the Senate. Senator Dianne Feinstein was the ranking member in the last Congress of the Senate Judiciary Committee. During the confirmation hearings for Judge Amy Coney Barrett, who was later confirmed as an Associate Justice to the Supreme Court, uh, she fought that nomination tooth and nail. Uh, she was uh, a, a really stalwart member of her party in opposing that. However, in the closing arguments in the last days of the committee hearing, uh, she said some nice things about the Republican Chairman Lindsey Graham. And just to show you how partisan Washington has become, uh, she will not be allowed to move into the uh, committee chairman position on judiciary for that reason. And so because of that, that's going to cause some, some fluctuations in Senate leadership. And while we look at that, I'm going to give you an example of some situation that we could potentially see. There are three things we need to keep in mind. Number one is Senate seniority. Everything in the Senate is done by seniority. The longer that you have been there, the more uh, authority and power that you wield in that body. You also have to think of committee hierarchy. Not all committees are ones that uh, members want to serve on. Um, there are, there's, a, there's a hierarchy to the, the committee structure that everybody wants a, a piece of the really, really big and, and awesome committee. So that's another thing to consider. And then the last thing is ambition. You know, some of these senators are well into their 80s. They don't necessarily have the chops or the desire to go and be pit bulls anymore. They kind of want to sit back and be Scottish carriers. Pardon the dog analogy. So, as a, as, as a fun little example, this is no way, in no way confirmed, but here's a, a way that that could affect things. So, obviously, Senator uh, uh, Feinstein is leading her role as judiciary. That means that Dick Durbin from Illinois is the most likely Democrat to take over as chairman of that committee. He also is the Democratic whip in the Senate, which means he's the number two under Chuck Schumer for the Democratic Party in the United States Senate. He will have to vacate that role if he decides to take over as judiciary committee chairman. If that were to occur, then Senator Patty Murray from Washington uh, would be the next in line. However, she's also up to chair the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, or Health Committee, which is another one that Democrats really, really want to control. It's a very powerful committee with a broad reach. So she likely is not going to take over that number two position. Similarly, Ron Wyden is going to Senate Finance, and he is the next in line that would get that number two Democratic spot. And then uh, Sheldon, or excuse me, not Sheldon Whitehouse, this is Jack Reed from the state of Rhode Island. He is set to chair the Senate Armed Services Committee. That is a very coveted committee as well, not likely to take that number two spot. Tom Carper, um, you know, the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, not necessarily one that is often fought over, but again, that comes back to the ambition question. He's been in the Senate a long time. He probably doesn't have a lot of ambitions for higher office once he gets out and done with uh, being Senator for Delaware. He may take that position, but he may not. And if he doesn't, that brings us to Debbie Sabanow, who uh, would very much, uh, in our opinion, have that ambition to take over as the uh, Democratic whip and take that position, in which case that would open up the Agriculture Committee chairmanship. Pat Leahy chairs appropriations, so he won't do that. Uh, this is uh, Sherrod Brown from Ohio. He's not likely to take that either because he's set to take the gavel on the Banking Committee. And that would probably bring us to Amy Klobuchar. And I bring that up because she is a member of Congress that we have worked with very, very frequently. We have a good relationship with that office and a good track record. So just a little bit of an example of how one person vacating a role can have a big shift uh, in the, the makeup of the committee structures. Let's go over to the House of Representatives really quickly. Obviously, the Democrats have maintained control of that chamber. However, their margin has drastically been dwindled. The Republicans had a very, very good House election in the 2020 race, um, and they have narrowed that gap to a handful. Um, as a matter of fact, if you look at the current party breakdown in the, in the House, uh, there are 211 Republicans to 222 Democrats. So as of right now, there's only 11 votes. Uh, that can be lost on the Democratic side of the aisle uh, if they're trying to get a bill pushed across the finish line. And then there's two vacancies, and I want to touch on those real quick. Uh, the first one is in the Louisiana 5th, which is a very safe Republican seat. Um, Congressman-elect Luke Letlow, unfortunately, after he secured uh, a win in his election, passed away from complications due to COVID-19. There is a special election set to take place um, on March 20th. 
to choose his successor, but we anticipate that that will be a Republican hold, given how uh, much of a conservative district that is. And then in the New York 22nd, Representative Anthony Brindisi, who is also a friend of our industry, uh, was one of the leads on the Real Meat Act when that was introduced, is going up against uh, Claudia Tenney. Uh, that is also a, a, a typically safe Republican district, but during the blue wave, uh, Brindisi was able to take that seat. Um, unfortunately, that race has just been really down to the wire. It's very, very close. And right now, we're probably not going to see resolution in that seat until January 22nd. There's a court case uh, to deal with that election, and that's what we're expecting to see. Just to show you how crazy this is, this is a timeline of that particular race. You can see that after recount, after recount, after recount, you see Brindisi up 12, Tenney up 12, Brindisi up 14, Tenney up 29. Um, that really goes to show how tight this race was. So at the end of the day, we're going to see a Democratic advantage of about nine or ten seats. Now, new committee chairs, we expect to see Congressman David Scott as chair of the Agriculture Committee. Again, a really good friend of our industry. Uh, he previously uh, was the ranking member for the Commodity Subcommittee that oversees the uh, commodity exchanges like the CME Group. Uh, he is a known quantity, and we are looking forward to working with him and his team. On the appropriations front, we obviously do a lot of work in that process every year. Uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut. Uh, there are going to be some significant challenges with her wielding the gavel at appropriation. Um, and that's something that we are preparing for and trying to engage with her team to make sure that our interests are best represented in the annual federal uh, budgeting process. Some of the folks that um, have held the gavel are going to be returning. Uh, Frank Pallone at Energy and Commerce, Raul Verhalb at Natural Resources, um, probably one of the most anti-grazing, anti-cattle members of Congress and Congressman Verhalba. Congressman DeFazio from Oregon will chair transportation, and Mr. Neal, who holds the all-powerful gavel at Ways and Means, uh, and he will probably be the architect of the Biden tax plan, um, will return to his seat on Ways and Means. We have some new ranking members on the Republican side of the ledger. Congressman G.T. Thompson from Pennsylvania will be the new number one Republican on the Agriculture Committee. Um, we have already established a strong working relationship with him and his team and his staff. Uh, we are ready to hit the ground running with him. The same goes for Congressman Bruce Westerman from Arkansas on the Natural Resources Committee. He succeeds Rod Bishop, who uh, previously held that role during the last Congress, um, and he will be a great person to work for. Uh, the other uh, committee that we engage with on a regular basis is Energy and Commerce, and we expect to see a strong ally in Congresswoman Kathy McMorris-Rogers from Eastern Washington. And I'll turn it back over now to Ethan uh, to kind of round out how we're going to approach advocacy for the cattle business in this new landscape. Thank you, Tanner. As you can see, there are a lot of moving pieces in Washington. Uh, there's a lot of change. There's always change at the beginning of a new presidential term, but but this is sort of a, 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 a hyper uh, hyper version of that. This is this is a more change than we usually expect, and a lot more committee turnover as well. But one of the things that we can really look to um, is you know the fact that we do have some some folks that. Uh, really are kind of allies that we can engage with uh, throughout this process. Um, you know, and, and we're going to have to continue to build those relationships. We're going to have to reignite some of the relationships uh, that, that we've had in the past in order to try to find some common ground and some, and some path forward. Um, you know, folks like you see on the screen here, Tom Vilsack, uh, uh, the incoming Secretary of Agriculture, uh, and, you know, Abby I, 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 Spanberger from Virginia are, are folks that, that have been sort of vocally uh, looking for opportunities to connect with our membership. And we feel like that's a real opportunity for us. Uh, that's something we're going to really be engaging on. We already have uh, a robust dialogue going with some of those members. And, and we feel like with those Titans majority uh, on both sides of the aisle, that creates a lot of opportunity uh, for us to find some common ground with these members. So we're going to be looking for those opportunities to get away from partisan bills. We're not, we, you know, we've always kind of taken the approach of looking for co-sponsors that can really find both sides of, of the issue, Republicans and Democrats, and even numbers. Um, that gives you the best chance of moving legislation in Washington. Never is that going to have been more important than it will be moving into this 117th Congress. We're also going to have some folks that uh, obviously um, we, we have had challenges with in the past. Uh, incoming Interior Secretary Holland, should she be confirmed? That is going to be, as I mentioned earlier, an area where we're going to have to really uh, hustle to, to build some, some new relationships and, and get our 
uh, messages across to her team as they take office, uh, either be it at the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, or any of the agencies that are overseen by the Department of Interior. Um, we talked about Debbie Stabenow a little bit already. Uh, that's going to be another relationship that we're going to have to really engage with uh, and try to find some, some new areas of understanding. And then Peter DeFazio uh, from Oregon. You know, Peter DeFazio is a, a member who, who uh, very nearly lost his seat in this election uh, to, uh, to a Republican challenger. Um, and he's a guy who, as he has shown over his career in Washington, um, one of the most well-versed members in the policy that I've dealt with. Um, he definitely does not see a lot of these issues the same way as we do. Um, but when, in his time on the Natural Resources Committee, uh, he is a member who does not need a briefing from staff. He knows the issues, he knows the positions, um, and, and, and he, is a, he is a smart legislator. Um, these are going to be some of the challenging uh, folks in Washington that we are going to have to engage with um, in order to get our uh, priorities advanced in this new uh, environment. So how are we going to do that? We're going to continue to advocate for common sense in climate policy. We have a fantastic story to tell in the cattle industry as it relates to climate and sustainability. One of the things that gets missed in that is, is the coverage in the press. And, and, and often, a lot of the folks that are coming in are coming in with bad information, negative information about climate impact from the cattle production. And that's based on uh, a lot of outside agendas. And they're not, they're not strange to any of you on this call. Uh, we're all familiar with the work of the Humane Society of the United States or PETA or any of these groups that try to sell a vegan agenda or a non-meat agenda. As we also know, They've not been terribly successful selling that type of lifestyle beyond that same 3% of uh, folks that kind of come and go from, from making a vegan lifestyle choice. So what we've seen over the years is a lot of those types of groups trying to use climate as a new way into that conversation. You can't beat them on, on the uh, animal welfare side because our record of animal welfare is so good, then they want to go towards the climate piece. We're going to have to push back on that with facts. We're going to have to push back on that with our low emissions footprint. The fact that we're only 2% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, three if you factor in the feedlot and input. This, this, is, this is the real numbers despite the fact that what we hear is often multiple times that um, in, some of these, uh, in some of these media outlets. We're also going to have to really engage aggressively to protect some of our gains from the last few years, as we've talked about previously. Uh, navigable waters protection rules, a replacement for WOTUS is a great example of that. We're also going to have to really push hard to defend the beneficial tax changes uh, that we saw in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act back in 2017. Danielle Beck on our staff uh, put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears along with our volunteer leadership into locking in some of those changes in that important piece of legislation. And as we mentioned earlier, that's going to be back on the docket again. And we're going to have to spend a lot of time defending a lot of the critical regulatory victories that we've won in our industry over the last four years. So I'm talking about things like regulatory changes to NEPA, regulatory changes to the environmental, uh, uh, the, the, excuse me, the Endangered Species Act, the delisting of the gray wolf nationwide. Now, these are all issues where NCBA, along with some of our partners in other industries, are in federal court defending these rules alongside the current administration. We fully expect that on a lot of these, the new administration will make the choice to stop defending those rules in federal court. That's why NCBA goes to the effort it does to intervene in those cases. So your voice is protected at the table in those conversations, regardless of changes in administration. Now, that doesn't mean that a new administration couldn't promulgate a new rulemaking uh, to undertake a several-year effort like the Trump administration did to make new rules. Um, but we still will have that seat at the table and that voice in some of that ongoing litigation. And, of course, we'll always be looking to advance our industry priorities as will be shortly determined by NCBA members at our upcoming winter business meeting, uh, as we do every time, every every year around this time. And that'll really set the guidepost for what you all want to see from us as far as production and wins in Washington, D.C., moving into the next few years. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Josh White. Uh, so we can go to the question and answer portion. Thanks, Ethan and Tanner. Uh, great job. And we do have a few questions already coming in. I did want to quickly uh, let folks know, hopefully you've seen some of the communications coming from our convention team about the um, uh, winter reboot, we're calling it, that we're doing. We've had a lot of folks out in the country telling us they wanted uh, 
a little taste of convention this winter, even though we've had to move the uh, in-person event to August. And so we're answering the bell there. Uh, this will include a cattle fax outlook, a deeper dive into the policy scene with um, Ethan and the DC team, as well as a breakout session on how to best advocate for the industry. And then our team is putting together some great content. Um, just had a call today with ag economist Jason Lusk about a talk, talk he will do as part of this. Uh, we've got folks on genetics, on reproduction, and several of the animal science and business topics that you love that we'll be uh, doing from the producer education team, um, as well as uh, comments from our volunteer leadership and others. So um, I would encourage you to check it out. You can see the information here on the screen about how to get into uh, the registration site. If you're not a member, we'd love you to join anyway. You hear all the great work that our DC team is doing, and you'll get this for free if you're a new member. If you're an existing member, it's $75, and uh, $50 of that charge will go toward your registration to the in-person convention in Nashville in August, so only a $25 net to you. And um, we will get moving to questions. Um, one that came through just now was, um, I think, referring, it came through actually right after uh, Tanner was finishing up talking about who was going to lead different uh, different roles, and it was asking about Bernie Sanders, uh, the rumor that he may end up leading a budget committee and what potential impact of that might be. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we do anticipate that Senator Sanders will take the gavel over at the Budget Committee, uh, and that does have, of course, uh, a lot of different implications. Of course, you know, before we can pass appropriations bills, we have to pass a federal budget. And sometimes those are two years, sometimes those are shorter, sometimes they're longer, um, but that, that person will wield some pretty great authority over that. Um, obviously, uh, you've seen uh, throughout the course of coronavirus, there have been a lot of different uh, appropriation bills and uh, stimulus checks definitely uh, don't, uh, they're not free. They cost money and there needs to be new budget justifications and reconciliations that go on uh, in that process as well. So it's something that we're monitoring for sure. Um, but uh, in the meantime, you know, I, I don't expect there to be much of a budget fight uh, in the first couple months of this Congress, at least. Um, Danielle Beck on our team uh, is the one that monitors this issue very closely, um, and I, I don't expect that we'll uh, have too much worry about that for the for the next couple of weeks at least. Awesome. Another, there's several questions coming through that are related to specific issues that the Trump administration was able to, um, you know, significantly change or roll back on the regulatory front. Uh, from the previous Obama administration. And the questions are essentially, do you see the exact opposite happening? And what, what are the big issues you see the Biden administration and the new uh, Democratic controlled Senate and others trying to take action on to reverse some of Trump's changes? Well, we know from our discussions with the transition team that they're looking at a lot of those regulations now. That's, that's kind of job number one in any transition is to take a look at what uh, what the, the folks that are on their way out have done over the last four years and start to put your priorities together for how you want to spend your time. Typically, what we see at the beginning of a presidential handover between parties like this is sort of a blanket uh, uh, swiping away of some of the lower hanging fruits. So think executive orders that are easily reversed. Think regulations that are promulgated in the last 60 days of an administration. And we're certainly seeing a lot of that kind of activity now. One of the things that's been encouraging in our conversations with the transition team is uh, they've, they've indicated that they're not necessarily going to take that broad brush uh, to a lot of that stuff. Certainly, there will be a lot. They, they will undoubtedly um, un, undo a lot of the executive order activity that the president has, has undertaken. I would think immigration is going to be really high on that list. We're likely to see action on that immediately after uh, President-elect Biden takes office. Um, but, you know, some of the other rulemakings that we're seeing move through the system, some of the previous previously completed work, um, they're, they're taking a look at that and trying to determine if they want to throw the whole thing out, if it's something they can work on and make some changes to, to kind of remake it a little more in, in their, their view of it. Um, so that gives us a little bit of an opportunity to, to talk through some of these items. 
you know, some just party platforms being what they are, are going to be viewed as anathema to this new team coming in. Um, you know, the Endangered Species Act is a prime example of that. I have no doubt that a lot of the progress we've made on critical habitat um, and, and some of the consultation processes will go in for a review, but they will have to initiate the same kind of multi-year rulemaking process um, that, that the Trump administration had to do. And, and before then, the Obama administration, you know, if we think about um, sage grouse issues in the West, some of these nagging issues that are with us for, you know, not just years, but decades, um, there will be new chapters of that moving into this administration. But what we like to remind people is the system is not designed to move quickly. And I think the Trump team found that out over the last four years. The federal system is designed to move slowly and to contemplate. Um, so nothing is going to happen that took a long time to do uh, uh, very quickly. All of that's going to take just as long uh, to change as it took to do the first time around. So the, the timelines are going to be roughly comparable to how quickly they were able to be implemented. Great, and you gave a great example there, Ethan, with um, immigration, but there are two uh, issues that I'm getting hammered on in the Q&A uh, portal here in the chat. A lot of folks asking about and concerned about estate tax changes, and then the other one is, are we getting WOTUS back? That's coming up again and again in the chat. Okay, yeah, those are, those are both uh, uh, good questions and top hot button issues. Um, WOTUS, obviously the, the current regulatory structure is the navigable waters protection rule that is the replacement for WOTUS that NCBA and others have worked so hard on over the last few years and are now in federal court defending uh, in multiple venues uh, undoubtedly administrator Regan on his way in will want to revisit that rule uh, at the end of the day the thing we always remind people is you know all of this action on this on this rule stems from that initial Supreme Court decision seeking clarity on what can be defined as a water of the U.S. The new navigable waters protection rule, similarly, is there to provide additional clarity. So it'll really come down to, again, moving that, moving that line back and forth between a more, uh, you know, a broad interpretation that extends control over larger amounts of land versus a more narrow interpretation. Regardless of who is in charge, the safe money says that some rule at some point is going to have to go back to the Supreme Court for them to sit in judgment on. And that is where in the current Supreme Court, we have a much more favorable balance of judges uh, that will be looking at that rule. Um, so, you know, certainly we're going to see uh, engagement on the navigable waters protection rule. That is probably the safest bet in Washington right now. How that ultimately ends up impacting the implementation of, of that in the Clean Water Act, is, is still uh, yet to be determined. We'll, we'll obviously be aggressively engaged in that discussion, making our views heard, um, and, and we'll see what we can get done. Um, on the other side, on the estate tax, that's another one that, that unfortunately, rather than being a, a dollars and cents issue, has become a political issue. Um, that's another one where we're going to have to continue to help some of these folks understand just how big an impact uh, that estate tax can have uh, on, on the preservation of some of these multi-generational ranching operations. Um, that's something that Danielle Beck has already started engaging on. I can tell you that our coalition in Washington uh, that's working on those issues has already started laying the groundwork and filling sandbags, so to speak, for what we know will be upcoming battles. Because remember that estate tax reprieve that was built in uh, that moved that estate tax limit up to that $11 million level uh, back in 2017 does have an expiration date on it. Um, so that's something that is going to come back up for discussion again. But again, remember from our discussion earlier, folks like Senator Joe Manchin and Susan Collins, some of those moderates in the U.S. Senate, are going to be able to play a really important role in some of those conversations as well. Um, so there are some opportunities there to engage folks on the other side of the aisle and look for some friends on that issue. Thanks. Thanks for that, Ethan. Great uh, balanced response and and. Um... I think you guys have job security there. There's always a, another war to fight. This is a great question. I've been bucketing some of these up by category, but here's one I'm going to read verbatim. Uh, how possible is the idea from the incoming VP to limit red meat consumption? How in the world could she do that? Great question. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, look, we, we have a new set of dietary guidelines that was just published. Uh, that new set of guidelines is the product of a lot of hard work on behalf of NCBA, 
uh, and uh, our, our, our beef checkout contracting side, 22 sets of detailed technical comments filed uh, on that on that process, as, as well as a robust lobbying operation on the policy side here in Washington, D.C. And the result of that, while not perfect, never is, uh, is a set of di dietary guidelines that keeps beef at the center of the plate, that talks about the need to seek out uh, dense sources of nutrition. Um, and and, and, and that, that's exactly what we got out of that process. Um, nevertheless, obviously, the Cory Bookers of the world, the Kamala Harris's of the world, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others um, have really hooked into this idea that it's, it's cool in their sections of the Democratic Party to advocate for a reduction uh, in meat in people's diets. But I think what we saw during the coronavirus pandemic is that the American people disagree. When they went to the store to fill their cases and their, their, their refrigerators, they filled them with beef. Um, we, we saw that firsthand, obviously, in the supply chain issues and the box beef spread issues and the pricing issues that we have been battling in this industry uh, for, for more than a year now. Um, so, you know, there's, there's the desires of the far wing of the party um, and sort of what's in vogue in the Democratic Party. And then there's the reality of the very narrow margin of victory in this election, the very narrow margins on Capitol Hill, um, and the fact that uh, in a lot of ways, this administration coming in is very aware of the fact that they have a rural problem. Um, they have a problem um, engaging with some of those voters who uh, very much like a steak, kind of like the one I ate about 30 minutes ago. Um, so we expect that, uh, yes, we are going to hear a lot about that, but as far as actual ability uh, to, to start limiting what Americans can choose, uh, to fill their plates with, uh, that, that's going to be an awfully rocky road for them, and, and NCBA will be standing uh, right in the middle of that road, uh, making sure that nothing like that happens. A few more questions coming in here, and uh, we'll, we'll try to wrap up at the top of the hour. For those of you that are hanging on, if you want to stay on for just uh, a few more minutes, um, have you had? A, have you guys had a chance to look at what Biden uh, put out today, the American Rescue Plan? being referenced in some of the economic uh, activity in there, especially uh, federal minimum wage change, uh, some things that might affect the labor market is what they're, uh, what they're looking at. So you're really putting me to the test tonight, Josh. Um, I have seen the, the high level mention of it, but I have been on webinars like this one since about eight o'clock this morning. Um, so I have not dug into the details yet, but um, I know our team has, um, so we will be pushing out some information, I'm sure, uh, at the appropriate time on that. Okay, and one uh, that you'll probably have, uh, you or Tanner will have an opinion on for sure and have thought about is, what does this mean, this new administration for BLM land leases or contracts? Do you guys think they'll go there fast or, or in the early part of the administration? Yeah, I mean, that, that's always one that for those of us from the West, um, we, we worry about in, in a new administration. Uh, like this one. Um, you know, incoming uh, nominee Deb Howland doesn't have a whole lot of a record on those grazing issues specifically. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she's been more focused on some of the monument stuff. She's been more focused on, on some of the tribal issues. Um, so we're, we're going to have to get in there and really help her understand uh, how important that multiple use concept is. Um, and, you know, we've made a lot of progress over the last few years, and I'm counting even the end of the Obama years here, uh, on helping them to understand the importance of grazing as a tool to manage wildlife, to manage wild, uh, wildfire uh, fuel loads, and, and preserve a lot of that open space that, that we know and love so much. Um, that's something we're going to have to really continue to advocate for and, and help them understand. Um, you know, they can't just come in and swipe away preference grazing rights overnight. Um, you know, but but we're obviously going to have to to engage really aggressively. I know the Public Lands Council um, and and our folks that that uh, that we share with PLC um, have already started having those conversations. Um, having formerly run that organization myself, um, there's no better voice in Washington to engage on those issues, and, and I know they're already getting fired up to do exactly that. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining and for sending in those questions. Uh, there are a few that I'll pass along to the team in D.C. that got a little more specific, and we've got your uh, email address if you put the actual correct one in for, with your registration so we can get you some specific answers out. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work um, with folks across the country, whether it be animal science experts, economists, and others on this webinar series, but it's even more special when we can uh, work together with our teammates in D.C. who are working hard for us every day 
and I uh, really appreciate you guys and the great job tonight. So, uh, again, remind everybody, jump in uh, online at ncba.org and look up that winter reboot session. We'd love to have you join us there for even more of this great content and others that you've, other types of content you've heard on this webinar series. With that, I'll wish everyone a good night and uh, stay safe out there.